Um, we are talking during the series about babies that change the world, and these are the 300 bone variety, as we just found out. Um, and so we're going to be uh, trying to, to figure out what it is that um, these, these birth narratives in the Bible are talking about. And today we're going to be talking about a character that you may have heard of because he's popular not just in Bible culture, but also just in culture in general. Um, he's known for something really famous, being extremely strong. And some of you already know who this person is going to be. His name is Samson. Samson is one of the most interesting characters in the Bible because he is known for his absolute brute strength. He is known for just being a beast of a man who could um, do anything he wanted with his muscles. He was the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the Old Testament. And, and this was a guy who, uh, who, for a lot of people, serves as a hero. But we're going to look at how, in some ways, the story of Samson is as much a tragedy as it is a, a, a tale of a hero. Uh, and so we're going to look at that story today, and, uh, and, and I want to kind of give a little bit of the backstory to how we got here. Last week we talked about Moses, and, and we know that Moses uh, brought the people out of Egypt into the New World. Uh, he wasn't the one that brought them into, into the Promised Land, but he brought them right up to the edge of the Promised Land. They come into the Promised Land, and remember we talked about how they were God's kingdom, they were God's people. God was supposed to be their ruler. Uh, but the people, the, the Israelite people, would stray away from God. They would stray over and over and over again. They would remember God, and then they would slip into worshiping some other idol or some other God. And then God would do something or bring some sort of nation to oppress them. And that's when they would remember, oh yeah, that's right, that's when I need God. That, I think a lot of this happens in our own lives. When bad things happen to us, we suddenly remember that we're supposed to be talking to God daily. So we talk to him when we're in trouble. Um, some of us, this is how we handle our relationship with our parents as well. Um, but whenever uh, Israel's in trouble, they reach out to God and say, God, I haven't talked to you for a while, but please save us. And then God swoops in and saves them. He sends them some leader, um, and then the leader comes and saves them, and then they slip back into the same practice again until the next crisis happens, and they just go crisis to crisis to crisis. And what's, what those people are called are judges. God's bringing these people to the to the uh, to the Israelites that are called judges. And the judges are not necessarily royalty. They are people who are in charge of, of, you know, kind of gathering Israel's military and making some sort of positive change by driving out whatever enemy is oppressing the Israelites. They were God's instruments of military might to, to lead God's people into battle and to defeat whatever nation was oppressing them. The interesting thing is, though, as all of this repeating is happening, as they go from crisis to crisis to crisis, from judge to judge to judge, every judge that they have gets a little bit less reliant on God than the previous one. So not only are they going from crisis to crisis, from judge to judge, but they're also getting a little bit lower quality judge every time, and it kind of devolves. And it devolves to the point of the last judge. And the last judge is Samson. And so while Samson might be seen as a hero, might be seen as somebody who is very powerful, somebody that we like to tell stories to our kids about, turns out that Samson was not all that great of a person. And so if you want to read with me, we're going to be opening up uh, Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13. It's going to be on the screen if you don't have it in front of you. Although since you're already on your tablet or your computer, you can just pull it up. BibleGateway.com is a great place to go. Judges chapter 13, starting at verse 1. Here's how it goes. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And it says again because the, the writer of Judges is basically having to change the narrative. Every single time they serve God, they get a judge, then they're good for a while, then again they do this, and then they go back to that, and then they go back to this. It's just back and forth, back and forth. So again, it says, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so that the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Philistia is the country that's next to Israel, and it was always their number one enemy, and it would always try and attack them. It, was, it wasn't an empire like the empires that took over Israel. It was basically an annoyance. These were two countries that just went back and forth fighting for all of the time that Israel existed. Flip to the verse 2 there. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless. She was unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless. I bet at this point she's like, duh. 
You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you, that, the, that you do not drink any wine or any other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and you will have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel. Very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, You will become pregnant and have a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink. And do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the day he is born to his death. Now a Nazarite is someone in the Bible who was considered to be set apart. In fact, in the book of Numbers, God tells the Israelites that the Nazarites are supposed to be people who are set apart as his holy people. They're supposed to be like some sort of like super Israelites. And there were some people that took a Nazarite vow for a short time. Some people would take a Nazarite vow for a month, two months, almost like a, a Lent commitment kind of thing or a fasting commitment. They would decide to become Nazarite for a while. There were other people that were Nazarites for their entire life. And then there were people who were Nazarites from the day they were born because their parents decided that they were going to commit their child to being a Nazarite. And, and that last category is the category that Samson falls in. God asks the, the, the parents of Samson to commit him to being a Nazarite, one who holds a vow, one who is respectful of God because he has taken an oath. And if you know anything about the Bible, oaths are really important. When you take an oath before God, it binds you to that promise. Oaths in our culture have kind of gone downhill because we don't take our oaths of marriage very seriously. We don't take our oaths to, like, you know, pay our debts very seriously. We don't take our oaths to, you know, kind of you know, file our taxes correctly very seriously. Like, oaths have very little promise in today's culture. We have to make all sorts of uh, deals because our, we're not very good at keeping our promises. But in that time, if you broke an oath, if you broke an oath, you would be seen as somebody who was put out of the society. In fact, a lot of the times that you would make an oath, you would have some sort of secret handshake. Similar to like if you were one of those little boys who did the blood swapping thing back before, the, b before we knew that that was a bad thing. You ever seen the blood, the blood brothers where people would cut their thumbs and then they would press their thumbs together and the blood would mix and that was a sign that you were going to be blood brothers forever. There's, there's, a, there's a story about Abraham in the Old Testament where as they're making, as they're making the deal, the, uh, the person he's making the deal with holds the inside of his thigh as they're making the deal. Basically to say, if you, if you pull out on this deal, I'm going to cut you up down there. Um, and so, like, like, they were very serious about their oaths in the Old Testament. That if, if you broke an oath, you might as well be a dead man. And so this oath was being taken very seriously. And enter into the world, Samson. Now, there's, we're going to read through the next couple weeks these stories of, of birth narratives and what happens in the Bible when God comes to somebody before they're born and says to their parents, you're going to have a child. It happens probably five to ten times in the Bible where there is a, a, a family, a, a woman who is unable to have children. The first of those we talked about in trivia, which was Sarah. Sarah was unable to have children until she was 90 years old, and then God visited her with an angel and told her she was going to have a child. She thought it was hilarious, so she laughed. And, and then we read about this with Samson, and we're going to read it about other characters as well, but there's always some common things that happen. The first one is that they're almost always visited by some sort of angelic being to tell them that this is going to happen. The second thing is it's almost always someone that's been barren and childless their whole life, which, as you know, can be psychologically really difficult for a woman. And, and if, you, if you know anybody who's struggled with infertility, this, this can be the kind of thing psychologically that can break apart marriages. It, it can make people depressed. It can, it, can, it can really mess with you. But in that culture, it was ten times worse because in that culture, if you were a female, like your job, the way that you, that the way that you were able to create value in your world was by producing sons. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but what I, what I am saying is that in that time, 
they, they were, women were able to be very productive members of society if they were able to bring sons into the world who could bring, bring forth an inheritance and they could own the land and they could protect their mothers in their old age if their husbands died. This, it was so important to have a child, so important especially to have a son if you were a woman in that time. And so when this angel comes to this man and his wife who are unable to have children, they know that this is a blessing. This is not only an amazing thing because a baby's going to be born, but, but the angel says to them, your son is going to deliver your people. So not only, this is just going to be any run-of-the-mill baby, this is going to be a baby who is going to be a national hero. Imagine knowing that when your child is in the womb, that your child is going to be a national hero. And, and knowing that also then gives Samson's mother this place where she knows that that she is suddenly going to have a much bigger purpose in this world than she previously had, that, that she, has, she is going to be doing uh, something that, that is amazing. It's similar to how Mary must have felt when she was about to give birth to Jesus, but not in the same way, but, but a small little part of that, where she knew that there was something big that was going to happen, and she was going to be the cause of it. Talk about motivation not to drink coffee or whatever it is that you're going to do or take care of your pregnancy. This, these, these women who were promised these these world-changing children had to feel like they were a part of something much bigger. And this is where Samson enters the world. Now, the interesting thing about Samson is that Samson almost always keeps that oath that his parents promised for him. That Nazarite oath where he's not supposed to drink any alcohol, he's not supposed to drink anything, you know, even related to grapes. He's not even supposed to have grape juice. Anything related to grapes is out. He's also never supposed to cut his hair, which must be very offensive to Diane and, and other uh, hairdressers that they would take their business away um, by, by taking this vow. But you can imagine what this guy's hair must have been like without daily showers and without, you know, the luxury of being able to brush your hair as often as you might want. You can imagine that instead of hair like Fabio, he's probably got hair that's like matted and nasty and like dreadlocky. Not because he intended to, but just because he's living like a wild man outside and it's just like kind of getting gross. But you can imagine that, that, that this guy who is, who is brutally strong, like a bodybuilder, and has this long flowing hair, must have been seen as like the ultimate leader. I, I can imagine him shirtless on the cover of People, you know, on the cover of Time magazine. Like, this is the kind of leader people want, right? Like, a ripped, shirtless leader with long, flowing hair. Like, this is the kind of, like, this is the kind of Chris Hemsworth leader we're all looking for in today's world, right? This is who we want to lead us. No more of these old guys being president. We want someone who can beat up the presidents from the other countries. And beat them in a, in a beauty pageant, too, by the way. This is who Samson was. He was the leader they always wanted. He was the leader that everyone was excited about. And yet the problem was, as is the problem with a lot of really good-looking people, I hear, he just wasn't all that smart. <laughs> he was dumb. Now, if you're sitting at home and you are good-looking and smart, shame on you. Leave some for the rest of us. But this guy, Samson, was very good-looking and very strong and very powerful. But he was not in control of his own person. And so you would expect that if you were the leader of God's people, that God had ordained to be the savior of his people, that, that you knew that you were going to be in charge of God's people, that you would have an active prayer life. Or you would be sacrificing to God. Or, or you, would, you would constantly be asking for God's opinion. We never see Samson pray to God until the end of his life when he dies. He may have before that, but we don't get record of it. You may have expected that he would sit and, and hold court in a castle or, or some sort of leadership place and be able to, to present that he is the leader and the people could, could follow him and he could be trusted. But we don't see him doing that. 
you would think that, that this could be the kind of leader that people could get behind and really, really, really support if he would stand at the front. And you can imagine an army following this guy into battle and, and wanting to be on his team, unifying the country. But that's not what we see Samson doing. What we do see Samson doing is chasing women. Now, I want to tell you about some of the amazing things that Samson did, but I want you to also realize that every amazing thing Samson ever did was because he had done something stupid beforehand. Okay, so every amazing thing he did was just because he had done something stupid beforehand. So here, here's the first one. Samson, one of the most famous things that Samson is famous for is that he killed 30 Philistine men by himself. 30 Philistines, he killed them all by himself. Amazing, right? What, what a warrior. Well, then we find out that the reason he killed 30 men was because he was getting married to a Philistine woman, by the way, the country he was supposed to be freeing his people from. And he made a bet with his groomsmen. And he lost the bet because his, his fiance sold him out. And, he, and the bet was that if he won the bet, he would get 30 suits of clothes from those people. And if, and if he lost the bet, he would have to give them each a set of clothes because there was 30 groomsmen. And so he loses the bet because his wife sells them out. And so what he does is he goes and kills 30 Philistines and takes their clothes and then gives them away. Kind of makes his accomplishment seem a little bit less amazing. The second thing that he's really famous for is that he... Uh, he goes out and he, he collects 30, 300 foxes. Now, I, I can't even remember the last time I saw one fox, but somehow Samson goes and collects 300 foxes. <laughs> and he ties the tails of every two foxes together. So he's got 150 pairs of foxes. And you know how foxes have bushy tails, right? So what he does is he takes a fire and he lights the tails of the foxes every pair that are tied together, and he puts them out into the fields of the Philistines, and they burn down the fields of the Philistines because all these foxes have their tails on fire. Crazy, crazy political and, and military accomplishment. But why did he have to do that? He had to do that because he was mad, because the wife that he had married, he had gone away for a while, and she had gone ahead and married someone else. So...
All right, we're back. Sorry about that, friends. My battery died. So what I was saying is that every situation that Samson got himself into was a situation that he was in because he put himself in that situation by being him, by, by listening to his own motivations instead of listening to God's motivations, by, by creating some sort of stupid problem he had to get himself out of, and then he had to beg or hope that God would help him get out of that new situation. And, and this is who Samson was, but I don't think it's that different than how most of us are. I think most of us, the miracles and the amazing things that we ask God for, that we see God do, are often God rescuing us from our own mistakes, rescuing us from our own predilections, from, from the things that, that we do that are not what God wants us to do, and then we find ourselves with the natural results of those things that we do, and then we have to pray to God and ask him to take us back out of that. So in some ways, Samson is just like an example of what happens to you and I every day. We forget God, and we ask him to bail us out of the situations that we got ourselves into in the first place. The other thing that's really sad about Samson is that Samson is almost exclusively doing everything that he does by himself. Every other judge that's come before this and every other leader that will come after Samson has at least an army. Maybe a small army, maybe a large army, but they've got people, they've got family members, they've got people that are gathered around them to fight their battles with them. Samson, from the time he was young, didn't think he needed anybody. He also didn't think he needed to follow God's laws or God's commands. One of God's commands was, don't go and marry someone from another country, especially the country you're supposed to be defeating. But as far as we can tell, the only women Samson ever dated were women from the country that he was supposed to be defeating. He literally did exactly the opposite of what he was supposed to be doing. He never marries any of these women, so you can imagine that a lot of the visitations he's having are not in line with the way God has called him to live. This is Samson just being as bad as he can be and just accidentally also being a judge for the Israelites and defeating the Philistines because of his own rampant behavior. But, as it usually does, eventually his actions catch up with him. Samson is taken down, eventually. Can you guess who Samson was taken down by? A woman. What kind of woman? Where was that woman from? <laughs> the country he was supposed to be fighting, Philistia. And up until this point, Samson had kept a secret this whole time that, that his, his, uh, his strength came from the fact that his hair was not cut and he was a Nazarite. That's, that's where his strength was coming from, that his parents had committed him from his birth to be that person and he had lived that oath, even though he had screwed every other single thing up, even though he had been so selfish with his actions, he had somehow, some way, managed to keep this oath that his parents had made. And he made that oath, and he kept that oath up, up until he finally spilled the beans to his girlfriend, Delilah. And Delilah tricks him, not once, not twice, not three times, but she lies to him over and over again because he just can't help himself, because he's unwilling to ask for help, because he's unwilling to listen to even God. He continues to make the same mistakes over and over and over again, and eventually it costs him, and it costs Israel. And, and, and he is captured by the Philistines, and the first thing the Philistines do is they gouge out his eyeballs. And then he's kept a prisoner for years and years and years in the Philistine jail. See, the, the crazy thing about Samson, and I think it makes sense because today we lit the candle of peace, is that what Samson was supposed to be doing, his job as a judge in Israel was to create peace for his people. His job was to drive the Philistines away so that his country could experience peace 
and prosperity, and they could, they could live out their relationship with God. They could be protected and be loved and, and live in that covenant relationship with God. That's what Samson was supposed to be doing. He was supposed to be unifying the people, leading the people, protecting the people. But because he couldn't control himself, he cost his own country everything. People didn't learn from Samson. And if they did, they learned the wrong things to do. People were not unified by Samson. He spent more time in Philistia than he did in his own country. People were not, uh, were not created, didn't have peace created for them by Samson. If you don't think that the Israelite or the Philistians were creating problems every time he was doing these things and killing people with a jawbone of a donkey and killing 30 guys for their clothes, if you don't think the Philistines were, were bringing payment for that back to Israel by attacking them, you're wrong, because they did. They kept attacking every time. He actually brought more headache and more attacks and more frustration from the Philistines than they had before he showed up on the scene. When we don't control ourselves, it's almost impossible for us to lead other people. If we can't control this, if we can't create peace here, then we're never going to create peace here. Maybe you know somebody like this, that, that they're a parent of some children, or they're a teacher, or they're a leader in some sort of way. And their job is to be emotionally accessible. Their job is to, is, to, is to be a blessing to the people around them. Their job is to lead. Their job is, is to show the way. Their job is to, is to be the kind of self-controlled person that can create space for other people to flourish. But you and I probably both know people who are put in leadership positions who don't have control of this. And because they don't have control of this or this, they're completely unable to control peace outside of themselves. When there is chaos in us as leaders, then there is chaos in the world around us. When there is peace within us, then there is peace in the world around us. Samson was one of the most chaotic leaders that has ever existed in the Bible. And because he was so chaotic, chaos just followed him. It followed him to multiple weddings. It, it followed him to his visits to, to Philistia. It followed him into his own family. It followed him straight up until the end where he ultimately ended up committing suicide by trying to kill a whole bunch of Philistines by knocking down a building that he was tied to the pillars of. This is a, this is a leader that was so haphazardly leading his people that every powerful and amazing thing that he did that people will tell stories about was not planned, it was haphazard, and it was chaotic, and it just happened, and it just so happened to help God's people in some sort of way. Samson crash-landed the plane of being a leader. And I, I think there's something there for us to learn. That there's, there's peace, and, and, and there's the need that we have for, for peace and order in our lives, and if we don't have that, we oftentimes just create a lot of chaos and havoc around us. But I, I also think it's important to realize that God chose Samson on purpose. That God chose Samson, that God was able to use his power through Samson. It repeatedly says in Scripture that the power of of the Holy Spirit would come, across, come upon Samson when he would get into these difficult situations. That even though he was like literally one of the worst characters in the Bible in terms of leadership, in terms of communication with God, in terms of leading his people, that God was still working through him. And if there's one thing that, that you can probably glean from the Samson story is that if God can use Samson, he sure as heck can use you. Because Samson was just about the, the, the most ridiculous person that God had ever used. And, and even though he was completely out of control, even though he was completely in service to his own addiction, God still used him. God still reached him. And it wasn't until the very end where his humility hit. Or that humility of having his eyes gouged out and being tied up like a prisoner and being laughed at and ridiculed as someone who was brought in as a, as a party favor to the, 
to the Philistian people to show him off as their prize. It wasn't until that humiliating point where he was able to find the humility that he needed to speak to God and say, God, would you allow me to channel your power? And, and that's really why the story is a tragedy. The story is a tragedy because if Samson would have realized that when he was 19 years old or 14 years old or 10 years old, if Samson would have realized early on that it's through humility that God's power, th God's power flows, it is through humility that we are able to do amazing things through God's power. If he would have realized that, he wouldn't have only had to rely on his brute strength. Can you imagine how powerful Samson could have been if he had humbled himself before God and asked for help? If he had made a plan? If he hadn't been run over by his own desires and his... And his his own, uh, his, his own thoughts and, and had to submit himself to whatever was happening and whatever woman he thought was beautiful at the time. Like, if, if he had stopped and thought and made a plan and asked God to be a part of what he was doing, Samson could have been one of the most amazing leaders that Israel had ever seen. But he didn't. He did exactly the opposite. He led through chaos. He led through lust. He led through a frustrating way of, of going it alone and not involving other people and, and trying to, trying to you know, be involved with Philistian women and also still fighting Philistia. This was a man who was completely outside of the realm of strategy, completely outside of the realm of humility, completely outside of the realm of trying to channel the power that God had to work through him. But maybe it's not too late for you. Maybe, maybe you're thinking about, man, I, I have some things in my life that God could use me for. I have some things that, that, that some gifts that God's given me that, that if I could combine my gifts with, with God's power, just think what sort of things could happen. Just think what kind of impacts God could make in this world. All of us have gifts. All of us have the ability to ask for God to help us. All of us have the ability to humble ourselves, to come before God and say, I might not be the strongest man in the world. I might not min a, win a Mr. Universe kind of pageant, but I do know that you've given me gifts and skills, and Lord, you know better what to do with them than I do. I don't want to be running on autopilot anymore. I don't want to be the one who is in control anymore. I don't want my lusts and my addictions and the things that are holding me down, those, those psychological battles I keep fighting in my head, I don't want those things to be driving the car of my life. I want you to take over, and I want you to be in charge. See, even though Samson followed the rules, technically, he was still way out of control. It isn't about how well you follow the rules. He was actually a pretty good Nazarite for most of his life up until the end. But just being good at following the rules doesn't get you to the place where you, are, where you are humbling yourself before your God. It takes a humble spirit. It takes somebody who is willing to listen. It takes someone who is willing to rest and listen and have enough peace in their lives that they can create peace for the people around them. Samson, despite all of his accomplishments, was never able to do those things. Never able to fulfill the dreams that his mom probably had for him when she was carrying him. Probably never able to lead his people the way that his mother hoped for when he was being born and when she named him. But he stands as a guidepost and as a sign to each of us to say, how are you listening to God? How are you allowing God to lead in your life? And how are you allowing God's power to gain access to the control of your life? And once God's power is able to be flowing through us and we are willing to humble ourselves and allow him to take priority in our lives rather than our own things, we start to see that we can be agents of God's beauty, of God's grace, of God's love, of God's compassion, and of God's peace in our world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the story of Samson. Lord, we know that that Samson stands not as a 
not as a light to tell us the exact way that we should live, but as a cautionary tale of what happens when we allow ourselves to follow our own path rather than following yours. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be the kind of people that that don't just focus on following the rules, but are, are focused on humbling ourselves before you. That are focused on allowing you to shape our steps and our paths. That are focused on allowing your spirit to be our guide. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.